say in the Buddhist uh, suttas that the mind which is malleable is a mind that's fit for work and fit for the work of insight and calm. And that there's nothing more soft and pliant, in other words, malleable, than a mind that is properly developed and cultivated. So that's a very beautiful message to us, you know, that through the meditation, our minds aren't becoming hard and rigid and, you know, dogmatic, or we're not trying to sort of imagine that we know best, or, you know, we're invincible, or we should never kind of show any vulnerability, not at all. In fact, our minds are gradually being kind of softened and melted and um, smelted, as it says in the sutras. I'm not sure the difference between melted and smelted, but all very beautiful words which point towards a softening and a mm. um, purifying of the mind, which basically becomes like molten gold. So I wanted to draw on a couple of suttas, and you may have noticed that the sutta reference I gave you actually for the previous sutta, or the name of it at the Soul Removers 101, and then the next one is called the Goldsmith, that's 102. But the two suttas go together because one talks about purifying the gold, first of all, and melting it down. And then the next one talks about how during that process of melting the gold, we can use different methods to make sure that it gets into the right consistency. Um, and it's really interesting because it talks about three different qualities that we can bring into the practice and into the process of melting this gold in the simile. Um, and one of them is like blowing on that melting gold to make sure that you know it, it melts, the fire goes, but it also doesn't go too fast. Or maybe that actually makes the fire go right the blowing and then sprinkling water and then what's the other one just looking on just looking on so doing nothing right and allowing it to simmer down and settle um and those three are sim similes for samadhi which is like the blowing so you get things moving you get things actually stilling you're basically applying your mind to its object and then the sprinkling, cooling it down is like um, a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of joy and energy in the mind. I actually think those two are back to front, but in the suttas it's in that order. I actually think those two are probably back to front, I'm not sure. And then the last one is like equanimity, just looking on. And in the practice of samadhi, in the practice of stilling the mind, if we only do one of these, we get out of balance. So we have to learn to apply all three. And that's part of the soft mind too, the mind that's flexible and adaptive, responsive. Again, not a rigid mind that has an agenda, but a mind that adjusts and um, responds to the situation at hand. So it sounds like I'm already giving the Dhamma talk, <laughs> but I will go into a lot more detail, um, hopefully use some examples and also read straight from the suttas after our little meditation but just to introduce it first of all so that hopefully uh, yeah, you can be contemplating that while you sit and in the meditation which I'll guide gently um, I'll just bring out some similes you know of the soft mind of different uh, metaphors that we could maybe use to to try to get that attention which is engaged with its object but which is not grasping its object, you know, which is very light, like a gentle touch. Okay, so if you are settled and ready, we can begin with some meditation. I'm very glad you made it. You were patient enough to hang on. It's <laughs> good. So just choosing, first of all, the posture that your body is most comfortable and at ease within. So rather than choosing the posture for your body, you let your body decide. What sort of posture enables your body to feel restful, to soften and relax.
When you do have your eyes, you might notice that the posture you initially thought was optimal for your comfort still could be adjusted just slightly to ensure that your ankles have enough space between them. They're not pressing into the shins. To check how tight perhaps some of your clothing may be. And to adjust accordingly. To notice the distribution of weight on your cushion or on your chair. Just perhaps gently rock a little bit from side to side, allowing your body to find its natural equilibrium. Perhaps gently circling in the pelvis. Checking you've got enough support under the buttocks, enough of a lift so that your back is straight, but not rod-like, just alert and yet also relaxed. Perhaps rolling your shoulders a little bit just to invite them into the space around them behind them. Letting them sink down just a fraction. As your neck very gently extends. Feeling the top of the head and the space above it. And just inviting that length, sense of uplift through the spine into the top of the head. Noticing how this spine that comes all the way up through your trunk into the neck, the neck supporting the head, the skull. Noticing how this gives form and shape around which your muscles, tissues, Your flesh can just soften as though melting down toward the ground. Your belly soft, buttocks and thighs. The jaw soft. Relaxing any tension between the eyes. And just sense this body expanding slightly on every inhalation. as though your body were like a sponge full of holes. And the breath were soaking 
to every pore. Expanding this sponge. And on the exhale, any tension just draining out through all these little holes. Just as water seeps out of a sponge. Relaxing into that gentle rhythm, expanding on the in-breath, relaxing, releasing any holding, tightness, tension, contraction with the out-breath. without making any effort at all. Just being breathed. You may wish to have a rather expansive sense of awareness. Perhaps the size of your whole body or even slightly beyond around the periphery, the skin of the body. You may find your awareness settling on a particular place or point, maybe on the belly as it rises and falls. Or just on the breath itself. Wherever your awareness settles, lingers, hangs out, imagine it's soft like cotton wool. A very gentle touch. Barely there. Not disturbing the process.
see if also you can soften your mind toward any thoughts or emotions, wanted or unwanted, that might arise. Just accepting them with open arms. Even soothing them, embracing them the way a mother would embrace a little child. A child may be chattering, full of excitement, things to say. Maybe the child is sad, melancholy, has fallen over and grazed their knee. In the same way, whatever thoughts or feelings come into your mind, imagine you're that loving mother. Not judging your child, but just welcoming them into your soft, loving arms. Allowing them too to be soothed by the calming rhythm of your breath. And the child slowly settles down, knowing they're safe and accepted. And starts to enjoy the silence, the stillness of just a simple breath. And if you find your mind snagging or closing in, contracting around any experience, it may help to remember the simile of the sponge. Expanding your awareness. like a sponge full of holes. They get softer and more expansive, fluffier, lighter. The more those tensions drain away, that water. 
water flows out of the sponge. Picking up any pleasant sensations, especially on the periphery of your body. Maybe tingling in your hands. Warmth around the heart. or delight in the breath itself. Just allowing this soft, absorbent mind to receive even the subtlest of joy. Contented with little, easily satisfied.
So we're coming towards the end of this meditation. Just gently get a sense again of the whole body. The feeling tone in the body. The limbs sitting. The legs or feet against the earth, the ground. The hands in your lap or on your knees. Perhaps noticing if any tensions have loosened that little bit. Whether there's a greater sense of ease. More lightness. More relaxation. And just enjoy and appreciate whatever ease, whatever calm you notice now in your body and mind. Just relishing the last few moments of silence. And staying connected to your body. Listening to the resonances of the bell. As I ring the gong three times, And when the last sound of the gong fades, staying connected to your body and mind, you can gently open your eyes. I'm not sure how well Zoom does the subtleties of a a little metal gong. (laughs) But however it is, it's good enough. (laughs) Very good. Do you feel a little more peaceful, anyone? Yeah? (laughs) It's amazing how... uh, 30 minutes can really bring about a little change. And I think no change is too big to be, uh, not to be noteworthy. You know, how many people in life have tools whereby they are able to just relax and offer their mind a little bit of peace. It's really quite a precious gift, I think, that we have to offer ourselves. And um, it takes courage to let go and to allow our minds and bodies to become soft. So a soft mind is not a soggy mind. (laughs) It's actually a very resilient mind, capable of receiving some of the knocks in life and yet bouncing back. 
it doesn't make us passive or or um, like a vegetable you know anyone can come and cut you up and you just sit there and say well never mind it must be my karma <laughs> that's not really what a soft mind does a soft mind is kind of like a rubber ball or maybe like a piece of dough you know that you need if you need that dough you can kind of make shapes in it and twist it about but after a while it just kind of rises back up or if you drop a rubber ball on the floor it bounces back it's the opposite of like a hard brittle mind which is more like a a piece of cement or maybe a glass you know if you drop that on a hard floor it's going to shatter into thousands of little pieces or a windscreen that gets a little stone in it you know at first it looks as though it hasn't had an impact but gradually the whole windscreen starts to crack and you have to replace you know your your windscreen that actually happened to me um driving well I wasn't driving but my friend was driving me to the doctor and a very fast car sped past and threw up a small pebble and I said oh don't worry it's just a tiny little you know tiny little uh I don't know really small little hole it made but after a while it all kind of fell apart because that screen is just so hard yeah sometimes in Australia they drive with these horrible big bars on the front so like the four-wheel drives and they actually call them roo bars as in kangaroo bars right really nasty because of course kangaroos can jump out in front of cars they get dazzled by the lights and then these bars are basically to protect you but of course it kills the kangaroo <laughs> so a soft mind is actually a pliant mind and it's a resilient mind a soft mind is also kind and compassionate yeah. It knows how to respond to the suffering in the world. It has tools in its box, so to speak. It's also a patient mind and a forgiving mind. You know, it's the hard minds that latch on to differences, that even create much of the slightest difference to wedge a kind of sledgehammer between you and another person. And that really increases a sense of self, a solidified sense of self and other, you know. It exaggerates differences to find fault. So a soft mind is the opposite of what my teacher Ajahn Brown calls the fault finding mind. You know, the mind that always looks for what's wrong, whether that's in your life, in your relationships, in others, other people, or in ourselves. right? We often see all the things that are wrong in ourselves, even when our friends are telling us, you know, that some of those faults that we perceive are actually our strengths. <laughs> you know, sometimes they don't notice them, but sometimes they actually turn it around in a completely different way and say, actually, there's a quality there. You know, there's something beautiful in that. Whether it's your kind of sensitivity, I'm often told I'm too sensitive or oversensitive, but there's a beautiful sense of vulnerability, intuition, empathy in that. You know, I can feel others, I can feel my moods, I always know how I feel. <laughs> you know, that's a very alive area of, of existence for me. And because of that, I can navigate things, I can use my intuition to figure out, you know, what's needed in a given situation, even before all the facts are in. So that sensitivity, vulnerability can be a massive strength. As long as we have, again, that flexibility to know how to protect ourselves and withdraw when we need to. So that soft mind also knows how to adapt to the situation. Sometimes we want to get close to something. We want to have a good look at it, you know, and figure things out. Other times it's good to just step back and give things a chance to fall into place, a chance to become clearer to us. Yeah. In our meditation, it's similar. Sometimes we want to be really close up to the object that we're aware of whether it's the breath or the body sensations, we want to get right in and look at all the kind of changing phenomena, the same changing sensations, maybe even sharp pain or heat. It can be really fascinating to go there, especially when the mind is resourced and strong. I would say soft, right? It's soft enough to be able to um, move into that difficult area and remain flexible, remain um, able to withdraw when we need to. But at other times, our mind wants a little bit more distance from our um, experience. So you might find you want a, a wider field of awareness and just be aware of the body as a whole, you know, or the body at the level of the skin. 
sometimes I like to meditate feeling the sort of periphery of my body, but even a little bit further beyond that too, like a few inches or so, especially when spreading metta. When spreading metta, we can really move our awareness beyond the um, this physical energetic field and into a subtler energetic field that seems to carry those subtle vibrations out towards others, imbued with love and kindness and warmth. And this is also very beautiful. The same thing with the breath, right? If we can have that very soft touch, a gentle touch. I like to use this example of um, holding a bird, a very tender, delicate bird that's just got its first little fluffy feathers. And in the suttas, that's actually a simile the Buddha uses. He says, if you have um, like a bird, I think it's a quail. And if you hold it too tightly, it gets crushed. But if you hold it too loosely, it flies away, you lose it. It's similar with the breath. We want that just gentle protective touch, almost like you are wrapping it up in cotton wool. And I had a little bird in my hand in Perth, actually, a couple of years ago um, that kind of got separated from its mom. And they were a very beautiful kind of bird. I forget the name. Not a honey, honey something. It had sort of yellow stripes and little yellow fleck, um, like freckles and uh, black and white stripes as well. Very pretty. And this little bird was kind of stranded because it had flown from the nest a bit too soon, I think, and, and didn't quite know its way back. And at first we were just, wrap, somebody had put it in a sort of a kind of plant pot or something and wrapped it with tissue paper um, and just left it there for a while. But we were afraid that it might start to get thirsty or even hungry and, and not survive very long. But suddenly it started to sort of flap its wings a little bit and try and get out of that uh, box. And I thought, should I touch it? You know, I really wasn't sure, like if I touch it also, will the mother reject it afterwards? But I touched it just very gently so that it could sit on my hand. And then I put my hands around it, but at quite a distance. And then I noticed that its neck had so many feathers. Its neck was probably really tiny. So I just like made a, a kind of circle with my hand and held it there so that it could still move up and down, but it was kind of stable. And it seemed to like that. So it stayed with me for a while. And then from time to time, it would jump out and get onto my shoulder. And then it would come back into my hand and want to be held like that. And eventually, actually, it's a nice story because the mother found it. It was sort of flying very close by. And I thought, this looks like the baby. <laughs> Maybe it's the mother, you know. And uh, it obviously knew that uh, the baby was safe, but it definitely wanted its little baby back. And eventually, one of the monks came who looked after um the environment, I mean, you get like an environmental officer, a maintenance manager, a guest monastic in a big monastery. So he was one of the environmental officers and he said that it belonged in a little bush behind. So I took it there and just let it jump from my hand onto a branch and it grabbed the branch. And within an instant before I'd left, the mother was feeding it just like that. It was very beautiful. But that was a very nice example for me of like a soft touch, a soft but firm and reassuring kind of touch <clears throat> and so that little bird was was really fine another aspect of the soft mind or people who are soft so to speak and it doesn't mean stupid it doesn't mean they're a pushover it doesn't mean that will you know you can kind of um breach their boundaries or anything like that but a soft person is someone endowed with a quality of faith and trust with confidence and again, in the suttas, it gives a very lovely um, quote. It said that they are capable of receiving the teachings. And as the noble ones teach, so they understand it. And I think this is because a malleable mind, you know, a flexible mind is also receptive. Yeah, it can receive things without, you know, rejecting them outright. It can actually entertain different kinds of views, different kinds of possibilities. It's flexible. It can take other people's perspectives on board. Yeah, sometimes when we have this concrete, fixed, rigid mind, we just believe so strongly that we're right, you know, and we just can't stand it when somebody else expresses something even slightly different from us. It's like, they must be wrong because I'm sure that I'm right. But guess what? Every human being in the world is sure that they're right. Because if not, they would have a different view, right? You only have the views that you think are correct. And one of the beautiful things about the Dhamma, I think, is that um, 
we start off having some kind of preliminary right view. So we think, okay, we've sort of got it. Um, we've got an idea. But as we progress, it's almost as though we start to doubt our version of reality more and more. And I actually think this is a really wonderful thing. So that rather than becoming more and more sure, we start to realize that perception, view, um, the way we frame our experience is very dependent on our mind. It's absolutely dependent on our mind, right? You can wake up in a bad mood, the whole world looks full of misery and suffering. You know, even your past, you just remember all the things that went wrong and you string them together and create this kind of scenario that is your life. And yet in another mood, and especially for any women here who I think are more affected by like hormonal kind of seasons and changes, goodness me, it can change just overnight, you know, <laughs> at least for myself. And, and then everything suddenly seems to like fit into place. And I feel, oh, things are really not so bad. You know, I can have a much lighter kind of a more generous perception of my life, a more generous perception of others as well. And so which one is true? Which one is right? And I think over time we realize that none of them are really true. They're just approximations of reality, but that we can have the flexibility and the skillfulness of mind to choose perceptions that will serve us, that will serve us on the path, you know, that will actually lead towards wholesome states increasing, arising first, but then increasing and be becoming developed and becoming our strengths. Now, sometimes with the Brahma Viharas also, it can be really easy to um, practice a lot of compassion and then start to get um, sucked into a sense of the suffering, the, the enormity of the suffering in the world. And even then our minds can get heavy if we're not very, very skillful with that practice. And so the Buddha provides us also the, the practices of metta and mudita as a kind of complement to balance any kind of empathetic distress that may arise from focusing on the difficulties, the suffering, the sickness, the wars and problems in the world. We can also look at life with the glasses, the rose tinted glasses of mudita, if you like, and, and they're just as realistic because there's so much joy. There are people, you know, living in comfort and ease. There are people who have a lot of love around them, maybe a partner, maybe their family or children. There are people who do have enough to eat and that is most of us here, right? There are things we've done in our life which are wholesome, which are meritorious, which we can really feel pleased about at the moment, especially of our death. Sometimes we don't recognize those things as we're living because it's just normal, right? To be kind to someone or to do something you didn't really have to do. You went out of your way, but hey, it's normal. Anyone would have done it. But wow, isn't it wonderful that you could do that and that you have made a difference in someone's life, however small and expecting nothing in return. This is really beautiful. And I see this all the time in my privileged position as an arms mendicant because I receive the gifts of others and my very life depends on the generosity and kindness of people like you, people who value the Dhamma, you know, and, and want to put their energies into creating goodness in this world. And so we have to have this flexibility to be able to see the full picture and yet also know that this is not the final reality. This is not yet the way things are because we do have these um, hindrances still operating in the mind. So I did want to get into the sutta that I promised and um, there are two very beautiful suttas back to back and I'll just read a little bit of each because the first one is a simile. They're both similes about how to purify and soften gold. And that's why, um, what did we call this session? Maybe the malleable mind? But sometimes I call it the like uh, molten gold. I think I did another talk, the mind like molten gold. Um, because that's basically what we're doing. We're purifying our mind so that it really has some substance, yeah? So that it's of value, so that it's of worth. So this one is uh, the Anga Nikaya 3. That means the chapter of threes where there's usually three points in each sutta, and number 101, and it's called the soil remover. And the Buddha says, I'll, I'll, say, man, I'll say community, where he says monks, I'll say community. Community, there are gross defilements of gold, 
<clears throat> soil, grit and gravel. So that could be like greed, hate and delusion, right? That are defiling the gold. Now the soil remover or his apprentice first pours the gold into a trough and washes, rinses and cleans it. When that's been removed and eliminated, there still remain middle size defilements in the gold, fine grit and coarse sand. The soil remover or their apprentice washes, rinses and cleans it again. When that has been removed or eliminated, there still remain subtle defilements in the gold, fine sand and black dust. So the soil remover or their apprentice washes, rinses and cleans it again. When that has been removed and eliminated, only grains of gold remain. So here we could have quite a discussion if we wanted to actually pinpoint what they may be referencing. But I think just very basically for me, this seems to be talking about the coarser kinds of conduct of body and speech, perhaps. As I say, the first ones, the really strong defilements, the soil, grit and gravel could be greed, hate and delusion because they're the underlying um, tendencies that we have, the underlying most um, insidious defilements. And yet also, of course, it's hard to remove them straight away. But for me, this kind of indicates that virtue is the first way to start to purify and prepare the mind. You know, it's not only what we don't do, it's not only removing bad conduct, but also purifying our mind through performing beautiful, wholesome actions. And there's so much about this in the suttas, which I often discuss because it's really the foundation for the rest of our practice. And that way we're already starting to overcome the coarser hindrances to meditation. So that when we do go and meditate, we've got this little pieces of gold that we can then sit on the cushion with, so to speak. And rather than have to separate all the dross from the substance as we sit down, you know, like with a kind of really messy cupboard that you open and all this rubbish falls out. <laughs> Instead of that, we already have quite an orderly mind when we sit to meditate because our conduct throughout the day has been reasonably good. And then we can start the work of softening that mind, softening the gold. So the next part of this says the goldsmith or their apprentice now pours the gold into a melting pot and fans it, melts it and smelts it. But even when this has been done, the gold is not yet settled and the dross has not yet been entirely removed. The gold is not yet malleable, wieldy and luminous, but still brittle and not properly fit for work. But as the goldsmith or his apprentice or their apprentice continues to fan, melt and smelt the gold, a time comes when the gold is settled and the dross has been entirely removed so that the gold becomes malleable, wieldy and luminous, pliant and properly fit for work. Then whatever kind of ornament the goldsmith wishes to make from it, whether a bracelet, earrings, a necklace or a golden garland, they can achieve their purpose. So that's very lovely, isn't it? Because you can just imagine that goal becoming more and more bright, more and more luminous. And, uh, and I think in the commentary somewhere where it says um, fit for work, it means fit for the practice of meditation, for the higher practice of insight, samadhi, first of all, and then the insights that arise from that. When the mind is free from impurities, it is free from hindrances. And so the Buddha now talks about um, what he's referring to here. And uh, he says, so too, when, when a person is devoted to the higher mind, and the higher mind means adhicitta, it actually is a synonym for samadhi, um, there are gross defilements, bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. An earnest, capable practitioner abandons, dispels, terminates, and obliterates them. When this has been done, there remain middling defilements. So this is the middle sized uh, pieces of, uh, what do you call them? Like bits of grit in the gold. And they are sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will and thoughts of harming. So now that is not at the bodily or verbal level, but it's still in the mental realm. 
So we're actually thinking negative and unwholesome thoughts. And then again, somebody removes those, a capable practitioner removes those. And when this has been done, there still remain subtle defilements, thought about one's relations, about their country, their reputation, etc. When this has been done, there remain thoughts connected to the Dhamma. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because we often think that thoughts about relations, family, reputation, etc., is just quite normal, but it's still a hindrance to the practice of deeper stillness in the mind. And then even these thoughts connected with the Dhamma, it's called Dhamma Vitaka in Pali. Even this is known as a lingering obstacle to states of deep stillness. So he says that stillness is not peaceful and sublime, not gained by full tranquilization, not attained to unification, but is still reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. So at this time, we're still using some effort, you see. It's not actually become very, very natural for us just yet. But then he says the time comes when the mind becomes internally steady, composed, unified and stilled. The word is concentrated, but many of you who know me know that I avoid that word. So then, I mean, that's the translation, that's not the word, that's the word samadhi. But in Chinese, samadhi actually does mean stillness. So there's very good grounds for rendering it as that. So that stillness, that concentration, that samadhi is peaceful and sublime gained by full tranquilization and attained to unification, it is not reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. In other words, now the mind has become naturally pure, naturally um, soft. So then there being a suitable basis, they are capable of realizing any state realizable by direct knowledge towards which they might incline their mind. So this is the point about having a soft, malleable mind. You can direct it to anything you want to look at, whether that is past lives. And this is one of the Buddha's first insights when he um, attained enlightenment. He saw his past lives. He saw the way beings arise and pass away. And then if that doesn't resonate for you, he also saw the Four Noble Truths. He saw the way that suffering arises and that suffering can cease. And so you can actually direct a very malleable mind, which is pliant, which is fit for work, yeah, which is unbiased, you can direct it to things like impermanence, suffering and non-self. And again, because it is like that rubber ball, it won't shatter upon seeing these things. It won't be broken. You won't have a meltdown. <laughs> the mind has already been melted, if you like. Yeah, And so it can absorb these things without with barely any impact, it can be very receptive and open to something new. And that something new will be freeing for the mind. It'll help us overcome the last defilements, the wrong view of things like self, a, a solidified sense of self. And so just quickly, because there is a whole other sutta, but I did promise that this would be part of the talk. Um, there's another very nice passage in the next one called the goldsmith. And this is the one where the Buddha is saying that while we are working devoted towards that higher mind, devoted towards the practice of stillness and samadhi, from time to time, we should give attention to three marks. From time to time, we should give attention to the mark of stillness, samadhi again. From time to time to the mark of exertion, that's pagaha in Pali. That means rousing the mind or um, energizing the mind, possibly inspiring the mind, yeah? Bringing up energy. And the third one, from time to time, one should give attention to the mark of equanimity. The mark just means the phenomena of, you know, it just means to equanimity. And then he says, if someone is devoted to the higher mind extends sorry, attends exclusively to samadhi, it is possible that their mind will veer towards laziness. Have you ever had that when you're sitting in samadhi, things are getting kind of peaceful and it's like you're just slipping, you're just slipping off, getting drowsy, getting a little bit dull. 
and it's okay you know actually my teacher Adrian Brown says go through that stage because after a while the mind naturally starts to brighten and if you do try to struggle with it too much you can find you move into the opposite extreme of restlessness <laughs> so it's actually a very subtle thing but this is what happens when we only practice samadhi and we don't combine it with other things from time to time so then it says if they ex attend exclusively to pagaha to this characteristic of exertion it's possible that the mind will veer towards restlessness right so we have to use that as and when it's skillful to do so again being flexible in how we apply the mind if you're already restless you don't want to increase your energy you know you maybe don't want to pick up maybe a train of thought or um, a practice that increases energy in the mind like loving kindness or you might want to first calm the mind a little bit with uh, perhaps breath meditation and then at the end it says if one extend, attends exclusively to the mark of equanimity upeka it is possible that the mind will not be properly stilled or not be properly poised let's say for the destruction of the taint and I think here it means it might be just a little, a little bit lacking in direction and focus in the sense that it's not quite sharp enough, it's not quite um, collected enough to really uh, penetrate the truth. But when a bhikkhu or when a practitioner devoted to the higher mind from time to time gives attention to stillness, from time to time to exertion, and from time to time to equanimity, then their mind becomes malleable, wieldy, and luminous, pliant and properly stilled or properly poised for the destruction of the taints. So that is the simile of the goldsmith. And this is um, where he likens it to, again, melting gold. Suppose a goldsmith or their apprentice would prepare a furnace, heat up the crucible, take some gold with tongs and put it into the crucible. Then from time to time they would blow on it, from time to time sprinkle water over it, and from time to time just look on. That's the equanimity. I'm quite confused about the first two because blowing on it here is in the same order as the samadhi and the sprinkling water is in the same order as the um, exertion. So you could see it that way, you could see it the opposite way. I'm not quite sure, but I think you get the idea. Blowing too much makes the fire get a bit out of control, right? It gets a bit too hot and then you sprinkle the water to cool it down a bit, yeah. And then from time to time, it's at exactly the right temperature. So you don't need to do anything at all. Just like in meditation, when it's going well, you don't really need to do anything. The process starts to unfold on its own. But if you let it go too soon, nothing will happen. You'll just go into laziness, yeah? Or the defilements, the conditioning will take over your mind. So then he says, if the goldsmith or their apprentice were to exclusively blow on the gold, it's possible that the gold would just burn up. If they were to exclusively sprinkle water on the gold, it is possible the gold would cool down. And if they were exclusively to just look on, it is possible the gold would not reach the right consistency. But if the goldsmith or their apprentice from time to time blows on it, from time to time sprinkles water over it, and from time to time just looks on, the gold would become malleable, wieldy and luminous, pliant, and properly fit for work. Then whatever kind of ornament the goldsmith, goldsmith wishes to make from it, whether a bracelet, earrings, a necklace, or a golden garment, garland, they can achieve their purpose. And here the examples of that are not making bracelets, but actually wielding psychic powers. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's at that point where they want to like multiply into thousands of people or enter through keyholes and all the other wonderful things that are described in the suttas. But, uh, but more importantly, if you wish, you may um, gain such wisdom that with the destruction of the taints in this very life, you can realize for yourself 
the taintless liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom. And having entered it, one can dwell on it. So this is all possible due to a malleable, wieldy, golden, luminous mind. So I think this is a very beautiful angle on the Dhamma because it talks about, you know, this softness of mind. And it's a part of the Dhamma that's not often discussed. But I think it's very encouraging, you know, to see things in terms of whether our mind is becoming more malleable, more flexible, softer, more embracing of others, embracing of ourselves, embracing of our mind and our meditation, or whether it's becoming more reactive, brittle, hardened, contracted, then you can know that you're moving slightly in the wrong direction and just, you know, find ways to purify the mind, find ways to soften that gold, using stillness, using equanimity, or using a little bit of inspiration, yeah, bringing up some beautiful qualities in the mind. So I hope that is of some benefit. There's quite a lot in there. <laughs> But uh, I thought it was nice to go straight to those texts. So I hope that uh, that can be applicable to your life in some way or another. And now there's an opportunity, if you wish, to, um, to share or to comment, feedback, ask questions, anything you like. It would be really interesting to, um, to hear from you, especially if you have got any examples from your own lives. So please feel free. You can raise your hands with the little uh, raise hand button if you wish. Uh, we'll stop the recording so that you have absolute privacy. <laughs> <laughs>